be starting. Let me say a few words to finish the last discussion session on community power. Uh, then let's open up for discussion of especially anybody who has uh, some paper ideas or themes they'd like to discuss a little more open discussion and then we can go on depending on how much there is to discuss with, with you. Uh, <coughs> I laid out the section last time of the traditionally lived um, under Dahl, and we spent a fair amount of time on Dahl. It's, it's, this, this is the most important reading in the section, um, and we went over the the, the, sort of the background concepts. Uh, the methods, the results, and um, uh, contrasted these. And what I didn't get to, but I would get what well, I want to say a few words about, is just some comparative work that followed Dow and the other. Let's just say a few more things on Dahl and criticisms of Dahl. We went over the key concepts as these are not highlighted as much as they might be in the book Who Governs. And we talked about the, the big idea is that the, the distinctions between base resources, the base, Sources. And then the potential of power in a reputational sense. Reputational meaning how Hunter asked the question, which was, who remembers? What did Hunter ask his informants in Atlanta? Who's important in Atlanta? Broad, simple question. Dahl then stressed um, the concept of influence in the sense not of reputation, but of actual exercise impact on specific decisions, which he, he in turn proposed measuring with what he called the decisional approach. And the, the contrast with the earlier was that the decisional approach study concrete decisions that people actually made. And he, he asked, he and his informants would ask, who made this decision? And sometimes that was uh, loosely structured by Dahl, but in the next comparative studies, these were broken up into five questions. Uh, who initiated, who supported, who mediated and who prevailed. And the idea is that a decision tends to go through these phases. And so these are these are classics, general characteristics of stages of most decisions. Someone starts with an idea, what if we have a new a new downtown center, a conference center? Who then support it? Say yes, that's a good idea. That will help our urban development. And then other people would say no. It will cost too much in taxes, and there's no real evidence that the revenues will overbalance the costs. And other people will then mediate. It's often the mayor, people who are in a leader posi leadership position, like the chamber of commerce or the PTA, will say, well, let's listen to the arguments pro and con. And then after they do that, they, 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 they may take a vote, they may discuss, and they listen, depending on the different types of leadership structures that we've outlined, more centralized, more decentralized, more political, so forth. And then who prevailed? That is, who, what, which 
which decision was finally made and can we link it with particular groups more than more, more than others or, or not. Okay, so if this is the decisional approach, the, <coughs> the idea of the comparative works um, building on trying to build on the best ideas of all previous work was not to use one method, but to use all their methods. And to ask some questions about base resources, such as how many, how many members are there of a civic organization, if the civic organization is seen as very important, or a particular union, just an example of, say, unions. People have, for instance, talked about the police and fire are the most important workers because they have this, and oh, sorry, I should add, in those cities where you have education as part of the municipal functions, as we now do in Chicago, did not 20, 30 years ago. Teachers, okay, so teachers, you, and there, there are books by Bill Grimshaw, by, by Paul Peterson, um, basically saying Chicago is dominated, Chicago leadership is dominated by the teachers union. Um, and that, that is uh, maybe less visibly emphasized today. We had a strike which just over last week. Um, it's, um, it's, it was relatively calm, but the first, in the first term of Rahm Emanuel, arguably the teachers' union strike destroyed his legitimacy with the neighborhoods, and and he and he had and the president of the then teacher the then president of the teachers' union was so strong, so charismatic herself, and so emotional in the television coverage that it really weakened his. And she she smartly said, "You you don't know the city." you're not connecting with the neighborhoods and you're closing schools without paying attention to the neighborhoods, thus linking in with the, with the ethnic makeup and the neighborhood pride, as well as the gangs. So in my neighborhood where I live, right across the street is Dunbar High School. The police show up there at three o'clock every day, 15 minutes before the students come out and they escort the students with their police cars through the gang territory if those students are not members of that, of that gang. That is, it's the, 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 the importance of the gangs are so visible and they've killed so many people that it's clear the police will escort students who are not members of that gang every single day after class. Okay, that kind of sensitivity, the union, uh, attacked Rahm Emanuel as not having. He didn't have a sensitivity to the, the importance of neighborhood, which neighborhood you belong in, where you have to walk to. And so if you close a school and you have to walk through four different gang territories, you're four times more likely to be killed than if you don't have to, don't, if you don't have to make those transitions. Okay. <coughs> um, so, these are, these are the, 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 the contextual scene-like embeddedness of what is not a narrow decision about closing a school. It has a lot of other implications, this being a very salient one. Um, okay, the, the um, I'm making the point with these examples of Dahl's big, one of his big concepts is issue specificity. That who's important in one issue area like school board politics or the mayoral election or urban development may not be important in another one of these. And I, I put, I'll put this on the board a second time. You can have these three different issue areas and maybe that almost no one overlaps among them except the mayor. That was Dahl's basic finding. However, Hunter and other people over here give you an image like this, that the leaders in one issue area are the same in any other issue area. And so having disparate findings from Dahl to Hunter to, to 
weather. And well, Hunter, Hunter did not measure. He didn't ask about issue rates. He just assumed that this is this is the way power was exercised in New Haven. And so, sorry, in Atlanta. And so Dahl contrasted with one other case study. There were 166 case studies like this in these years. People arguing back and forth, saying power is is centralized or it's decentralized. It's issue specific. It's not. Um, but these were virtually all individual cities, and no one tried to say why are they different from each other if we're getting these disparate findings. And this is true in life. And in most areas of research, if you have case studies of one phenomenon, you are, and then another person tries to replicate your study or takes parts of it, they say, hey, I get different results. Hunter found business leadership in Atlanta. Dahl says it's political leadership and it's decentralized. It's not centralized the way it was reported by Hunter. Okay, what do you do? All right, so, so we had a good 10 years of people arguing with each other I'll, I'll just read you, a, I put my finger on it, a, a, a baby uh, quote from a student of Dahl who was named Nelson Polsby. And he, and I was a grad student at the time, and, and he, he, I sent him a paper, you know, hoping he might comment. Dear Mr. Clark, I think I should try to preserve a solemn tone in this letter because I confess your latest paper had in it some things that I found quite offensive. You characterize my work as critical of the concept of social stratification. From this I infer that you believe I'm against the very employment of the notion of social stratification and sociological analysis. Utter bunk. I'm nowhere critical of the concept of social stratification. My work, you say, is written in a vindictive vein. This kind of remark may get you points up there for all I know, but if you intend to engage in scientific discussion, You'd be well advised to put up or shut up on something like this. I have yet to find a serious scientific or scholar investigator who welcomes this sort of overarching and undemonstrated character assassination. You place this in a, in a, in a uh, self-congratulatory rose garden of statements about how devastating you would be if, not, if you were not such a generous fella at heart. Unleash yourself, Chiang Kai-shek. Okay, this is, the, this is the tone of friendly collegial discussion at the time when I came into this field, trying to be collegial myself. Okay, so, so I didn't try so much after that with him. He, he, st he, he stuck to his guns on this for his whole career. Uh, <laughs> we had conferences in New Haven, et etc. et cetera. All right, so uh, basically, there were, there were more people, uh, sorry, the, the, the revolution came really in 66 uh, uh, or so. <coughs> when three of us took the previous case studies, Mike Aiken, Claire Gilbert, and I took, took, took all these 366 and we coded them in terms of these kinds of findings. Did they, who was important? Were they political leaders? Were they business leaders? Were they uh, sort of hierarchical traditional leaders classified by ethnicity or region? That is, we took these findings and coded them. We then coded the methods, decisional, reputational, uh, positional. And then we also coded the discipline of the researcher because some people had said this is an argument between political scientists and, and, and sociologists and other people. And we reanalyzed the results and we found there were no disciplinary, that is if you looked at the narrow handful of people right around Dahl, they were all political scientists uh, and some others were, who were fighting them were sociologists and others. But if you took all 166 studies, there were zero significant differences by discipline. Second, we then looked at the methods. And again, we found there were some differences initially with a small group. But if you, if you expanded out to the 166, they were, they were insignificant. Uh, so this in turn led us to say, then why do we have these differences which people are reporting? 
and we suggested maybe there are actual differences between cities. Cities may differ. Some may be more centralized, some may be more, may be more density. But we can't tell unless we have directly comparable methods and comparable analyses to permit us, us to compare whether or not there are actual differences out there. So we said, let's compare cities, but we've got to do it systematically. So we initially had a proposal here with, to go out and, and, and have both survey researchers and people who were local informants report on, on some individual cities. We finally changed it because we, we uh, people were too, were too engaged emotionally. So basically we said, well, let's, just, let's just work with the NORC researchers who normally study citizens and we'll go to the sampling points that they use for sampling citizens. And so we managed to get three sources of funding when nobody ever done this before. And we said, we're gonna study a huge number, 51 cities, okay. Nobody before had gone, there was, I mean, there were, there was one study of four cities. Case studies really presented as four separate cases, but without trying to compare, really. We said, we're gonna compare, we're gonna study 51 cities, and we're gonna make a, a representative national sample of where Americans live. And what did we find? There were some cities of all of these types. Both Dahl and Hunter were empirically correct in the sense that sometimes you have strong business leadership, other times you do not. Sometimes you have strong political leadership, other times you do not. Sometimes nobody is very important and everybody fights. All of these we found in, in, in different combinations, and these were generally unrelated, well, and so the issue of discipline and method um, um, fell out, but that is, it became insignificant when we analyzed in conjunction with things like population size and other characteristics I'll, I'll talk about in, in, uh, in just a minute. <coughs> But the field as a whole then moved to a more abstract level of analysis. Um, I'll just say we had, we had here three, three kinds of methods, the open-ended reputational method, the, um, the closed and this basically here is the closed and decisional, closed and decisional method. Um, we had a we had a closed end reputational method. An open ended open ended is who is who are the most important actors in the area of the mayoral election. So we added issue specificity to Hunter's question, and and people thus could say the same thing in each of the three issue areas or not. We didn't you know we didn't prime them in, in any way. The second the closed end version of the same was to say, here's a list of 15 actors that are sometimes important in, in, in US cities. How, Im how important are each of these on a five-point scale? So they could rank different kinds of business, political, unions, etc. So they could rank those. Then we could compare across the three, or no, we, had, we actually had five. We could compare across our five issue areas and then see how similar or different the the uh, city the, the the actors were across issue areas and then how that differed from city to city and but basically we found all combinations of these things um, were out there in different cities so Waco, Waco Texas had a strong kind of hierarchical leadership Waco um, uh, Amarillo uh, other places other places uh, were, were 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 very decentralized okay. Um, so, the, the, um, how make sense of this and why, why do this? Basically, in terms of the readings, um, this is what we see as we proceed from I want to go, go over the multiple readings and make sure I've said a few words about each of them. Um, Max Faber, Class Status and Power. Robert and Helen Lynn, Middletown's ex family. Floyd Hunter, Community Power Structure. The centralized model, continuing the business model, which the Lynn's had found in their 
in their Middletown uh, revisited book, um, Sayer and Kaufman governing New York, which really stressed decentralization and competition among multiple elites. Um, okay, Banfield, Banfield I mentioned briefly, and I'll, I'll come back and say a little more about, about Banfield later on. Let me add here, um, okay, not as, as, um, as well, I'm gonna defer Miranda and I'll, I'll talk about him again later on. Let me just bring in briefly the, the community structure and decision making book. The, the, the idea was to not ask who governs, which basically was the question in these three, but who governs, where, why, and with what effects. So basically it was including all of these kinds of boxes and arrows that we have here. So the earlier leader, the, old, the earlier literature really just focused on these central boxes. It didn't say how and why might they be stronger or weaker, which is, which is what, what these arrows show. And then what difference does it make? That is, even if you have, for example, all of the city council members are business leaders, do they make decisions that are different from a city council which has no business leaders? Okay, if you assume that base resources and being a business leader determines your decisions, then you know the answer. But if you say, with Dahl, it's an open question. You know, we, we need to study it to see. Then you could find, and so this led to a, another series of debates illustrated, for instance, by, I mentioned briefly already, Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe, California was, was studied by Mark Baldessari. And he, and he showed basically that uh, it's not business leaders alone but that business leaders were part of a consensual view that beautiful Lake Tahoe should be preserved and we should not have construction or development that would interfere with the view or the lake or the access to the lake and because that would be bad for local residents and for tourism and so it would be a bad thing to do. And so in that sense, this was the opposite of the view that Peterson and Dahl would discuss that business leaders often favor urban development because they, uh, Peterson argues, it should increase the land value. Well, it doesn't, so, so we're, I'm, I don't want to go too far with this, this, this point, but you can see it only increases land value if you don't destroy the main resource of the town, which is the beauty of the lake. Okay, uh, so crude, simple point, but it was, it was ignored by these people fighting with each other like Polsby and and, uh, and, and others and disciples of, of Hunter. And these issues are still going on today. Uh, uh, and which is why, okay. Um, the, um, okay, so how to transcend what is sometimes ideological or disciplinary or methodological debate? Basically our answer here is get data done, collected in a way that anybody can analyze it, anybody can reinterpret what you've done, but second, formulate some propositions about why and how leadership should, might vary. And so we have here population size. Bigger cities, other things equal, are more likely to have more decentralization, more variation. But most of all, we have, we have three big, we have general propositions about horizontal and vertical differentiation. So think, for instance, of a, of a one industry town like Detroit. If everybody's in one industry, you have a sense that, you know, the union and the leadership battles, that's everything in the town. In contrast to a differentiated and economically differentiated economy like Chicago, where we, we've always had many, many different lots of little industries and differentiation, uh, in which in, tur in turn encourages a more dispersed, more differentiated pattern of leadership among these, these economic uh, characteristics. Second, ethnicity. Um, 
You may have one or say two ethnic groups, which Dahl discusses in some detail, how the Italians became more important in New Haven and then became major political leaders of the 20th century. By contrast, in Chicago, we have many, we've had since the late 19th century, a large number of different ethnic groups. And so the competition among the ethnic groups and the competition among the business leaders tends to weaken the centralization, other things equal, in a place like Chicago with these, with these greater differentiated characteristics. Okay, so we took these kinds of propositions, uh, put them together, and then, and then looked at outputs, policy outputs, like higher spending. Does this, is the budget larger or smaller? Like air pollution, how active is the um, city in, in, in the days before the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, cities made all the decisions about air pollution. Uh, with EPA, the EPA says you've got to reach certain goals, but how you achieve those goals, you can decide locally. And so there's still, there's still a fair amount of differentiation in terms of policy outputs uh, <coughs> um, in ways that one can then say, is centralization, uh, so, but if, if, we, if we simply stick with budgeting, which there's a lot of literature on this, if you simply say, do more centralized cities spend more or less than more decentralized cities? And one idea could that when one hypothesis, one kind of finding was centralized cities like, like um, say Chicago with its political centralized centralization within the Democratic Party could lead to payoffs to your supporters and maybe that leads to more spending. Or conversely, if you have many people who have lots of projects, different ethnic groups, different, different neighborhood associations, and they all come, so, and New York, New York is a classic example. New York went bankrupt in the 30s and in the, in the 70s, or virtu virtually bankrupt, basically. New, New York has, has had deep, drastic neighborhood ethnic decentralization, but also a, a generally socially and fiscally liberal leadership from Tammany Hall onward through the 19th and through the 20th, uh, much of the 20th century. And instead of, and so the, the classic answer is if one, if one ethnic group or one neighborhood group comes to you and says, you know, we really need a, you know, we need some financial support for a Jewish hospital in this neighborhood. And then the next one says, we need to have a, uh, um, you know, a, uh, a Christian evangelical Baptist hospital in this neighborhood. So New York has, has more had, or I'm, I'm not sure what the numbers are now, but had huge numbers of hospitals, sometimes identified religi with religious and ethnic groups, and they then, by the late 20th century, had something like, you know, they had very high vacancy rates. Nobody was, that is, the number of beds that were not occupied was very high, and the city government was subsidizing these many hospitals, in part because people argued of the decentralization of the leadership, the, 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 the lack of coordination among the ethnic groups, the weak political party, that is, it was nothing like the Chicago Democratic, uh, the Cook County Democratic Party organization that coordinated. And so this in turn led to, to the discussion, which I'll, I'll go into, uh, I'll go into a little, little, little later, but, but I, at this point I'll leave it simply to say, this was a question mark. Where and why might these patterns lead to higher or lower policy outputs? And at this stage, and even with the first, let's say, 10 years, roughly five to 10 years of comparative work, we got many disparate findings. And so this, this, was, a, this was an open, continually discussed question for, for a number of years here. But my point is I'm laying out the framework of propositions which are comparative propositions. That is, instead of saying, is, you know, is the leadership with the implicit idea, sometimes explicit, both in Hunter and in Dahl, and in most of this literature, was if you study one city carefully, you'll understand the world. I mean, Dahl, Dahl would have 
perhaps slightly tongue-in-cheek, would say, you know, New Haven is about the size of Athens. And Aristotle really told us how these things work, and we're just updating Aristotle. But clearly, if you go to a place like New York, you can't expect to understand anything because it's too big. You can't have democracy in a big, big city like, like New York. If you really want democracy, it has to be a thing. I mean, so, so, so Dahl, in a sense, was saying maybe population size matter, but the rest is more, is, um, is universal. Whereas basically we, the comparative folks, said no. It's an open question. How much does population size actually make a difference? How much is it mediated by these, by these characteristics? How much do different ethnic groups have distinctive patterns of hierarchy, such as Catholics, may be more hierarchical than evangelical Protestants, uh, <coughs> uh, um, et cetera. Income, occupation, et cetera. Um, <coughs> so the, um, uh, the field then continued on in ways that I'll talk about afterward in the, in the next section, but I've, I've covered the main points leading there with the exception of the dimensions of power, and I, and I got through many, but not quite all of those, and I want to finish that before we have some a little more general discussion right now. And as I said, this was, I, I initially talked about the 16 faces of power in contrast to the two faces of power that were stressed by Bachrach and Barrett. And so we went through last time, just quickly to tick them off. One, interpersonal influence. Two, anticipated reactions. Three, direct and indirect influence. And I, I sort of showed you these through direct and indirect influence can go through person C with A, B, C. Um, um, and we can have reciprocity, that, that um, people influence, A and B both influence each other. Um, and six, patterns of value distribution. Um, illustrated, for example, with the Lake Tahoe concern with aesthetics, the aesthetics of the beauty of the lake. Um, Seventh, legitimacy, which I discussed briefly from Max Weber, um, and how Weber's three types we've extended and added two more with the scenes discussion. Number eight, the number of participants in a decision. If you just have one person making a decision or if you have deliberately more, um, these, these can change the dynamics of, of decision making. Um, illustrated, for instance, by the Swiss commune. Um, if they hold hearings on a critical, that is many committees, city council committees in Chicago and many American cities may meet privately with one or two council members. They may call in people to testify or groups to speak like the legal women voters or a budget agency and so forth. Um, they're usually one at a time. The Swiss often hold a hearing and they deliberately invite all of the major competing groups to come and discuss with each other with the idea that we want to build consensus. We don't just want to listen to two people and say, okay, we'll give you each half or we'll give you more. We want to, we want to change the decision in ways that we can incorporate the concerns of everyone and so this, this was called, or this is consistent with the, the, the idea of the Quaker meeting, New England, communalism. Uh, and it still is, it is, it is spread as an ideal countering some of the, the um, moralistic absolutism, which we all also find. So my point is these are no longer just regional historical specifics like Swiss Calvinism. These are debated in China, in Thailand, in, uh, in Africa today in terms of what is democracy? How, I mean, how do we, how do we, what do we do? How, what do we have to do to be democratic? And people are, people are arguing over these things. 
And, and so having some of the historical background and then seeing how the analytical components can be combined in different ways to redefine democracy when you're writing a constitution or you're trying to see how do people actually follow or ignore the constitution in Zambia or South Africa or um, Brazil right now. Um, okay, uh, number nine is the scope of power. This is the issue specificity idea, but if we go beyond that, we can also ask issue importance of how important is one issue compared to another. And if one issue is trivial, another is really important, then that changes the potential for, for instance, so-called log rolling. That is, uh, I'll give you, if you support, a council member may just say, if you support me on my most important issue, I'll support you on your most important issue. But if one is more is trivial and the other is hugely important for many others, then that changes the, the, the kinds of negotiations which, which may go on. So issue importance measured by, for instance, the number of persons directly participating or but that's crude. The second criterion is, is the uh, how much um, participants themselves say this is critical. So we asked that in the survey. We said, how important are the following issues? And so we have we had scores and we could see how much importance would change the ways that these that these decisions might be. The third criterion, the amount of money allocated in a specific issue area. Education is, is classically the most important for cities that have uh, public education. Um, and then Beyond that, criteria for evaluation of issue areas. And so we list um, um, ways in which these can be, these, these can be analyzed. Um, and this in turn relates to some of what we talked about earlier in the course. For instance, some of these may be, some issue areas may be more market-like. Others may be more hierarchical. Um, and that that's, that, and so the way you may get this versus this can depend on a time period or, for instance, Atlanta. Atlanta, when it was being studied, especially by, by, um, by Stone and by Hunter, was growing quite rapidly. It was a, bit, a big, it was the, the most important city in the South. It was growing quite actively. Business, businesses were trying to build new factories, bringing new people. They were borrowing lots of money and, and so forth. Um, how much does that change when, 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 when this, when this business growth slowed? And Stone himself basically said, "We're now in a situation where this kind of growth, fostered and called a growth machine, fostered by the political leadership and funded by um, interrelated groups, this kind of pattern is gone, or let's say it is no longer historically." characteristic of many American cities the way he suggests it was in the past. So how much that, that is, my, my sense is he, I mean, if, if we look at the results that I just mentioned here, he was wrong earlier as well. That is, there were differences then in all of these time periods. But second, I would add, as I said in a discussion, we had, as I said, we had a couple of discussions on this at the American Political Science Association meeting, when Stone says this historic period has passed, I would say you still may find strong business leadership today in some locations. And that and that the general and I'll come back to this and, and you heard you heard a bit of this when we talked about city money, but that is time periods are one way of trying to it's the, the classic historical way, historian's way of saying this period, the New Deal. World War II, uh, the late 60s, the counterculture period, etc. These ways of characterizing a period are, are loose, uh, but, but they, they, cap, they begin to capture some analytical elements which we can study either over by looking at changes over time or by comparing differences across locations at the same time. And this, having these kinds of data permits both of those things to be done, especially as we do this, we do the comparative studies and we've now done them 
six or seven times in the US, and then we've now done them internationally with 35 countries around the world. <coughs> and so we have data on now over, so we had, we thought this was big, big deal, 51. We now have over 10,000 cities from, from Korea to, to Spain to uh, um, Argentina. And we find huge variations all, all around the world. Um, Okay, so seventh issue importance um, number of participants in the decision. documents were available. Nobody knew what were the pending bills being considered by the Chicago City Council. There was no list in those days. Harold Washington, one of, his, one of the first things he did in the first week or two of his administration was to pass a Freedom of Information Act, which said that the press, the public, civic groups should have access to all of the city documents of Chicago at least by petition, or they in, into, and if they have a reasonable rationale for it, they should be made available. Okay, that was passed. It's not always implemented, or it may take a year or more to get it, but at least that that has changed the story very much. And, that, and there's been more and more happening like that, but the point is visibility of knowing who, you know, who's involved, who's, do, who's making these decisions is totally different from just saying at the end of the day, you know, the budget is passed and here it is. Take it or, you know, take it or leave it. No, you can't leave it. You, you take it. <laughs> it's yours. Okay. Um, um, Eleven, power bases. Okay, this is the idea of resources from Dahl. And so his list included things like money and credit, control over jobs, control over information of others, social standing, knowledge and expertise, popularity, charisma, legality, constitutionality, ethnic solidarity, and the right to vote. Okay, so these are quite disparate resources and they're distributed unevenly across different neighborhoods, different subgroups, different ethnic groups, income groups, and so forth. And so, how these then can be combined uh, gets to the concept of the twelfth concept of the application of power, stressing the idea that this is like uh, the physics concept between um, uh, kinetic energy. That that if you if you actually apply that energy, there's a certain loss or cost. In, in exercising these resources or exercising power by using these resources. That leads to concept 13, which is the, effi the degree of efficiency of the power application. Uh, that is, you may have a lot of money and use it poorly and have and shoot yourself in the foot. You know, uh, the classic examples were Chicago developers or Chicago Organizers showing up in, in Southern California, San Diego, LA, and, and they, they, you know, they walk into an office and they, and they uh, say, well, I'd really like to develop, put in a new mall and, and put in 150 homes here, but we, we need a zoning change. Could you help us? Then they'd open their briefcase and be a whole bunch of $100 bills in there. Oh, close that briefcase. Don't 
don't give any, you know, don't, I mean, you're implying, I mean, you know, it, the message is clear. That is, the disparity between where and how you might do things, then in, in that example, and I, I use LA, but you, if you do the same thing today in Pakistan, in Zambia, many countries of the world expect, of course, you've got to pay a fee to get something done. That's the way politics is done. And, still in much of the world today. There's a, there's a story, I think it was in the New York, I think it was the New York Times two, two days ago on how corruption in China uh, actually may, be, may have been beneficial in the whole period since World War II in, in, in enhancing economic growth. Alex Inklis did a basic argument on this for, for Russia saying that planning, you have communist central planning five-year plan, you must build so many trucks, we'll give you so many so many sheet metal parts and so many large frame pieces of metal, steel and so forth, but in fact they make a mistake and they didn't give you enough enough sheet metal, what do you do? I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're the leader, you may try to negotiate with the sheet metal factory and say, can you give me some more sheet metal and I'll give you something else. So they're not necessarily personally trying to take a, take money for themselves, but they're trying they're just trying to make their factory work work better. Okay, so that so that these kinds of things are going on around the world and they're enhanced in in, in, the, in those cases in Russia and China, they did not ex they, they denied the visibility in the in the old days of markets at all. So budgets were not budgets were not made prior in the, in the sense of constraining a decision, a budget priority in that way. Rather, budgets were made after people had made decisions about how many, how many, how much sheet metal you will get compared to, to, to this kind of uh, part of the car. And so the, the decisions were made in terms of physical commodities like X thousand tons of, of uh, sheet metal, rather than saying you can have um, you know, one million rubles worth of sheet metal because there was no there was no official market. Okay, okay. So interaction among these things can increase or decrease the efficiency of applying your resources. And so the the um, the many the so the at least the neo the neoliberal uh, economists will argue that markets are more efficient for allocating resources. Um, at least if you have the kinds of examples which I'm, I'm discussing here. But the point is this is a variable and we can measure uh, with various ways the degree to which different resources can be converted into influence. So it may be that, and so money, maybe money, I'm, I'm using an example where even money was not convertible in California by, by that developer. But <coughs> some of these things are very hard very, very hard to convert, whereas others, others are, are, are more so, and we can, we can compare these in the degree to which we have pyramiding, one of Dahl's key concepts, uh, or how different kinds of coalitions are built based on um, more public and more, and more separable goods. Okay, the, the um, number 14, the zero-sum problem in the allocation of resources. Um, Parsons made the made the big point that Dahl basically was arguing Dahl's definition of power was like this. A leads B to do something different because A wants it done. Parsons basically said, yes, you can see that happen in some instances, like a child and a parent. But if you try to look at a whole political system, this is a misleading conceptualization. And instead of thinking of power in these terms, we should think of power as more like money in a market, in the sense that we can have circulation of lots of more, a little more money or a little less money. So we can have a growth and we can have some inflation or we can have a recession where people say, I want to keep put my money under my bed and I want to keep it in jewels. I want, I want rubies, I want diamonds. 
I don't want to put it in a bank. I don't, banks may collapse. And so you have a shrinking of the total supply of resources which are available to others. And in many, many less developed countries, so, sorry, so one example, India. In India, classically, through the much of the 20th century, many economists would say the problem with, the, with Indian underdevelopment is so many of the, of the valuable resources are in jewels under people's beds or not, they're not, be, they're not spending their, their, um, their, their most critical kind of, uh, many of the critical resources which are being spent, say, in China. So contrast in that, in that way. Okay, so if, if we can say, if a political system, or, and another, another big variable here is trust. If people do not trust each other and say, you know, a dollar bill, that's a green dollar bill. I don't want that. I want gold. I will only take a gold coin or you know a certain amount of gold before I give you before I sell you my house. If you say that we're not going to use dollar bills, or you take it one step further and say we're not going to use electronic bank transfers. How much do you reduce the ability of that economic system to reach? Remember the concept: the extent of the market. You constrain the extent of the market. You constrain globalization if you say you must be a Canadian if you want to buy and sell a Canadian corporation. And you have to pay in dollar, in gold bullion. Okay, imagine, and there, okay. If that happens, or something like that happens, and contrast that with, in today, there, there's something like, the, the numbers are phenomenal. In, in, in one day, the, the dollar volume of the, of the trading that goes on among securities traders is something like the whole GNP of the United States. That's phenomenal. That is, there hundreds of billions of dollars are being traded back and forth. Stuff is being bought and sold, futures options. Does this base, is this based on gold bullion? No. Is it based on dollar bills as cash? No. It's based on trust that the banks have in each other and that the brokers have in the banks that they will make good. And so if you say you're going to buy, you know, $10 billion of this currency, you will be able to, imp you know, to buy it and to provide the, provide the, the, uh, the payment on time and you won't just say, oh, I made a mistake. We didn't really mean to buy that currency. Okay, so that kind of trust, and so Parsons' big argument was this kind of trust, if it's important in an economic system, it's even more important in a political system, and we should talk about it. And so the, the idea that power, power <coughs> is a zero-sum concept, that if I get more, you get less, is misleading and wrong. That, that if you have more money and more power and more resource availability to everyone in a political or a global system, then you can achieve more and people, there can be more global wealth than if you have a, um, a highly fragmented and distrusting kind of, kind of situation. Okay. Um, stop there. I've covered the main points in our community power section. And let's see if or if there are people here now who would like to, for instance, if someone has, has some ideas, a rough idea for that you might do a paper or you might just do a memo or do a little bit of uh, uh, something that you'd like to do as, as work and you'd like to think about it for the course, please speak out. If some of you are really doing serious BA topics or MA topics, uh, in the front row we have someone who sent me a phone.
fine memo, and I sent back some suggestions this week. Um, why don't we talk about papers or ideas for possible projects, uh, even even at calls? I mean, I'm interested in business power in the South. Could someone help me uh, and let and work on this project together? Um, but anybody want to? about unrest unrestricted markets. So you and I talked last week about just a little bit louder please. Yeah. Liturgy, how liturgy in Chicago is cha has changed or is changing in, in the Catholic hierarchy. And so when I happened upon the, these terms in this article, I'm wondering I was wondering if I could look at church spaces as where where expression is restricted, it's all Catholic, but in this space, expression is restricted to these behaviors. Whereas in this other space, in this other part of the city, expression is restricted, you have to do it like this. Okay, good. And so I was wondering if I could take this theme of unrestricted market and, and it kind of you, I'm, I'm babbling, but. No, no, these are, these are big, complicated issues. I mean, the, the most visible example I, I think of is, is uh, I mean, I, I did, did a paper on the Irish and Irish Catholics, and I spent, I spent seven years, I didn't, I didn't publish a word on this because I saw it was so controversial. And I finally, um, and so I, I, then, I then talked about it after six or seven years. I mentioned this to Father Andrew Greeley, who was a sociologist, priest who had a parish, uh, who had a PhD from here, and who was on the staff of NORC. And then later on, when I, I led the college sociology program, I got him appointed to teach in the college. Okay, I was invited to a session he had um, in a church uh, uh, and, 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 for, and to mass. First to mass, and then after the mass, we all met for, for dinner maybe 75, I don't know, maybe 150, 75 to 100 of his close friends, whatever. Um, maybe one third of them were wearing black outfits, priests, cardinals, bishops, etc. cetera. Uh, and and you, Andrew Greeley, for those you may not know, he was a major policy debater, discussant, ideologue, intellectual, in Catholic circles of what is Catholicism, what, what it should it be, and so So in the Mass itself, he wrote his own Mass. He, he, I mean, he was the priest who presented it. I mean, he was almost teasing and critiquing the Cardinal, the Pope, in doing the Mass. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was almost a, a talk show parody of what a Mass might, might, might be. Then at the dinner, he even went further, you know, of sort of critiquing and that, but that was his style. And he, 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 he just, he wanted to provoke the church hierarchy through his whole life. He, had, he did, he did um, um, synthesis, um, what do you call them? Columns that were paid and reprinted in hundreds of newspapers across the United States from the Sun Times and the Tribune. Uh, because he was such a visible, important spokesman on religious issues, especially of the, of the, of the Catholic hierarchy. Syndicated. He had a syndicated column. Okay, so back to where and why. So this, in turn, led me to be a little more sensitive. To, and, to, and so uh, people of people have talked to me as if I'm an expert on this. Uh, uh, but I've looked for other people. So, for instance, there was one woman who did a PhD on... Um, in sociology, uh, she was herself, I think, a nun, and um, she worked on um, the degree to which I think it was, it was 
something. The degree to which Catholic, the, the degree to which political leaders either had to be Catholic or would sh that is, I'm, I'm simply making the point that there are lots of variations from a simple standard approach. But there's there's not much literature. I mean, it's a small. I mean, you find four or five sort of major works on Chicago, you know, history. I mean, but they, they when one, I mean, the, the simple point, which we, we talked about it, it's related to ethnicity. And so, so I, um, I showed you with the scenes data, that Chicago has something like 850 Catholic churches. No New more. York and LA have something like 300 or 200. Chicago has, they've closed so many churches currently, it's like 330 churches. Really? Yes. Wow. Okay, yes. Now that, that's pretty They've dramatic. closed over time. I've been monitoring the closures. Okay, now, now uh, that's, uh, uh, that's very interesting. I, I, I hadn't heard that. And the majority of the closures have been on the south side of Chicago. Father Flager is kind of holding up Catholicism on the south side. And the Archbishop allows him, even though he's a very controversial figure, and his Catholicism is almost very, it's very Protestant. But he's allowed to do that. Um, my impression in looking at um, the various churches is that the churches mimic the neighborhoods. What Mount Carmel, the way that gays worship at Mount Carmel Parish on Belmont, they cannot worship that way at St. Cantus. St. Cantus is the Latin Mass. Families come from Indiana, Wisconsin. White family, that's white space. And they come in with seven, eight little kids. They live humana vitae, no, no birth control. Um, so yeah, these very interesting spaces. Um, recently we had the, the priest on the far northwest side who burned the gay flag that was hanging over the tabernacle. And he, the bishop, his, he had two choices. He could either report to St. Mark's. St. Mark's is a psychiatric hospital that's owned and operated by the Catholic Church. Or he can leave town and he chose to leave. So there are these very clear-cut ways inside churches that you can act a certain way there, but don't go to the neighboring church and do that there because you will be in serious trouble. Uh, this is fascinating stuff. I mean, this is, I mean, everything you're saying is, I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize that, they, that the number of churches had dropped that much, but, but and, this, and, the, the, and your cases are, are very compelling, very powerful of the differences and then the neighborhood specificity. I mean, I, or let me ask a sort of related question. I said there's not much written. How, how are you finding this? Is is any of this in a scholarly article Nothing. or a journalistic report? Are you, are you really coming up with it yourself? What I've done is that I've signed up for these uh, private newsletters that groups, these interest groups have that they share with each other. And that's how I'm getting the information about, that's how I found out about the priests on the north side that burned the, there was a gay flag that was hanging over the tabernacle. Wow. And when the archbishop took over, he went to meet with the various priests in their different localities. And the priest at this gay parish said to the archbishop, I'm gonna take this flag down, this is a heresy. And the archbishop said, leave it alone, it's not worth, too much, you're going to cause a lot of problems. So they had this conversation several times, and the priest burned the flag and said, um, I, I disposed of it honorably, and we will use it for Ash Wednesday in repentance of our sins. So, but, so, um, you, you've got fantastic stuff. I, I mean, I would say you could just give us some, given what you said, that there's no, that it's very hard to learn about this stuff. Right just describing systematically and clearly some of the some of these things alone would be a fascinating VA. And, so, and or and or think as well about appendices. Include appendices where you can, you know, paste some long sections or that that's because if someone else comes along next year and and I mean this these these are hard things that you that you're digging into, try to put them together in ways that I mean it's now if you can if you can they're online, you know, just put Don't them in an online edition. If they're only hard copy, you, you can still photograph them, at least have the image, and, and put, put, so save everything is what I'm saying. Save a whole lot of stuff 
and your, I mean, your instincts, your, you have thoughtful, analytical, sociological kinds of instincts, so, you know, making this into social science, interpret, asking hard questions. I mean, all, all of these are fascinating. I mean, there, there are lots of, lots of good videos. As a researcher, how do you take these informal fonts of information, such as these, these newsletters that are shared in private interest groups, do you, how do you, is that legitimate data, or is that, is that where it starts? Sure, sure. I mean, if, if, you, if you sense that something in the newsletter says that this may not be shared outside of our group, that's different. But, pre, um, but I, I doubt if they say that. Do no, you? no, no, no. Okay. You can, anybody so, so can that, subscribe. So I, I mean, if you, I mean if, and if you talk to people, and, and well, if you're really interviewing and so forth, you're, you, you should also do, uh, you should go through the IRB. Have you heard about that? Yes. Yeah, and so you should do a human subject that is, Think through what, how might I harm any of my participants? Lay that out, and then say, how can I protect them? And do, how can I act in ways that doesn't harm any person like this priest who, who burned the flag? Uh, but, but you ought to do that with your, with your preceptor. Who's your preceptor? Do you, uh, pre do you have a preceptor? No, not Fitzpatrick. No. But, the, but this is your, 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 this will be your BA project. Right? Yes. Okay, well, I mean, I'd say maybe talk, talk to the, or we, we can talk afterward and try, try to find how you can go, go, go that is, I chaired the, you know, the IRB for social science for a number of years, so I'm just sensitive that, that you, you, ought to, you ought to go through that, but. Yes, <laughs> because these are, um, so I've, I've already interviewed that, several. That, that applies to, to others who may be here or not, that is, if you're, and so, so the, the, uh, Harry Clark, who's doing sick today, but he was here last time. He was working on fandom with the Cubs and with football and baseball in Chicago. So he, he's going through the IRB right now. So um, pr some priests are willing to talk openly about these problems, um, but they're they're on being a priest. You are subject to your archbishop, and there are consequences for criticizing the hierarchy. For sure. So I'm having to be very careful with the questions that I ask. Okay. Um, well, terrific stuff. Um, I've read several, I mean, as I mentioned, I, I read several student papers which you dealt not the, with these issues, usually in Protestant churches. So you, you can have Protestant churches which will say, much more openly, we want to increase the number of our parishioners. And so we're going to have rock music, or we're going to have a famous a famous uh, rapper come to our church and rap during the, uh, during the church ceremony, or we're going to dance, uh, and then have after the ceremony, we'll have a dance party, and we'll have free food and alcohol and so forth. I mean, there, there are all kinds of things like that which churches do, uh, but the Roman Catholic Church is usually a little more, more constrained. And this is Chicago, which, which is <coughs> terrific. We got variation. I mean, where the extremes are also in places like Brazil and in Africa, where you get these open competitions between these evangelical churches, which have hugely increased. In Brazil, there are more persons who go to Protestant churches now on, on Sunday than go to the Roman Catholic Church. So the Roman Catholic Church, in turn, is feeling it's losing out, it's closing churches, as you say, and, and many Mexicans in Chicago are, have converted to evangelical Protestant churches. Uh, and so that the, the degree to which this is happening across the world is leading the Roman Catholic Church to try to not just disappear in numbers and politically. So, so how, how do, uh, so, so what was true 20, 10, 20 years ago is now being, Challenged, as you say, we, we should, we should you know, etc. So, I mean, all this stuff that is, um, I mean, I've I've learned through it mostly through student papers um, on Brazil, on Africa, on, uh, and then on individual parishes in, in Chicago. And I, but even now, I should say, you need to focus. And there's no right, I mean, you've got a hundred interesting, good BA topics in what you've said. If you try to focus somehow on hierarchy, on challenging the hierarchy, on the role of the arts, the role of music, um, 
neighborhood specificity, linkages to one or two ethnic groups. That is, it, it, there's, there's just too much for a VA to, to do to do too too much. So, so pretty soon you need to arbitrarily say, I'm tentatively going to work on may, maybe start with three topics and then say based on how much I can find, I'm going to cut back to one. And so I'd say keep that in mind. Now, and, and this this applies to most of you. That is, you're here at the USC, you hear these big ideas and you want to you want to have everything included in your BA or your MA or, or your PhD but alas, you can't <laughs> life is life is short and you have and you'll do more work after you finish your BA and your MA and your PhD and so there's, there's room for continuing things so so that I would say that that's that's my those are my general points if there's if there's something a little more specific that might talk about on this or okay I mean you've come up you, you've been very cautious in sort of raising issues in our discussions uh, but uh, in, in terms of you know I, I that is I can see you're you, you you're thinking hard you're digging far you're coming up with lots of interesting things and but so so and and you know more than I do about a number of these n n newer things as well which is which is great I'm happy to learn with you. As a, a, a whole other new project or an option would be just to study why the demo, why demolishing churches was concentrated on the south side of Chicago. Why did we demolish all the Catholic, black Catholic churches? Why was it concentrated there? Why was it, why isn't it on the west side? I mean, the, the, the quote normal answer is, is, is the numbers were the lowest. Do you have any data on numbers of parishioners by church and whether that was higher on the south side than elsewhere? I mean, same thing with schools. I mean, why are they closing schools? And that, I mean, the first is numbers. The second is the performance of the schools was so poor that they would close schools that are not performing well and then try to bring in better both teachers, principals, et cetera. Well, I think, I think Father Flager's parish, St. Sabina, if we can understand what happened in, in his immediate neighborhood, we may be able to understand what happened in the other black neighborhoods. And what happened in his neighborhood was that it was a thriving white church. And there were, the school was packed and then blacks migrated north and white people didn't want to live with black people so i think the turnover was like less than three years from everything i've read about his particular neighborhood and he wanted to leave the priesthood immediately after ordination he didn't like it he didn't want to be a priest and he didn't get along with the hierarchy and his plan was to leave and get an apartment then the pastor died. And by a freak thing, uh, Flager was appointed pastor. And in a very quick, in a very quick time, the composition of the parish changed. All of a sudden the school was full of black children and there were no more white people. But to what, were, there, were there an equal number of students now, black or not? Or did it just- When Flager took over? Yeah. No, like uh, white people left quickly. Um, no, but you're, 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 you're answering two things at once. Okay. Percentage white and total numbers is what I'm asking. Did the total numbers go down or not? For white or black children? Both. Total, combined. The number of white children drastically re dropped because they left. Yeah, you they said moved. that. Okay. I'm not understanding your question. I'll how have many, to look. How many, how many, if you had 100 children, uh -huh before and then five years later did you still have a hundred children mostly black or did you only have say 12 children i'll have to look okay no, i'll have that, to look again I mean, that start with that is i mean that I mean to add if you want to have three simple answers to your question is the numbers drop the school was having you know terrible time doing what it should be doing and third i mean what what's in the press or flagger and others will say it's racism Okay, now all of these are there, and there are probably at least six other factors which are going on as well. But I'm simply suggesting 
what we've been teaching here, especially here. Don't be satisfied with one answer. I don't want to rely on, on race. I want to know what, el what else was driving this. But you know, I wouldn't ignore race, but I would simply say, don't assume that it's only racism. That, that's all. And so if you look at it and think about I mean, my, my crude question, how many, I mean, how many students are there registered in the school? And, and start with that and then say how much is, et cetera. He has over 200 people on staff at St. Tobina. The cathedral doesn't have that. Wow. Okay. The cathedral does not have that. Okay. So he has a, a huge operation well, up there. Well, I mean, just doing a BA on him might, uh, and how some of this works in that one parish could be enough, for instance. But then you can cover more themes which are interrelated in this one, in this one I mean, because it, I mean, it's a very powerful uh, case. I mean, he's, yeah, question, no, comment? No, just a comment, I'll add something. Yeah, a little this bit louder? Not, yeah, this is not necessarily for the people, but just in general, something that I was interested in. Um, after we completed the midterm, I saw that the second article was about Hyde Park and just how Hyde Park is mm -hmm. and University of Chicago are working together um, to attract more intellectuals and students to the city. Um, and I was just mentioning this alone or are you mentioning this as a call to ask if anybody else wants to work with you on it? That, that no, it's I'm, just something that I'm interested in. And okay, no, fine. I mean, it's, it's a good topic. Uh, there are a lot of people who've written a whole lot on this already. So that's why I'm a little more cautious. That, that is, the, so I'd say the first thing to do is read a little bit of what people have already written on this. Whereas with the the Catholic liturgy and all of this, this, this is this is very new. And so there's there's not much you that as you hear that you can build on, and so it's harder to and so anything descriptive is reasonable. Now you can just do something simple and descriptive along those lines, but it's going to be the same as what a hundred other people have already done. So think think about I mean, even in this context of where and how you want to learn a little bit more yourself, and you can arti articulate the issues, but also ask yourself, am I adding anything to what we know? And you hear, I mean, if you work on, you know, if you choose it the right way, even if, it, if you're a first year college student, you can, I mean, uh, I, had, I taught a class in the college where we read, we read a journal article that came out 10 years before the book, which had the title, Bowling Alone. We discussed it with the first year students, and they immediately found the, the weak holes in Putnam's argument. That is, you are smart people here. You can do, you, you can have good ideas and you can show how smart people like Robert Putnam are wrong. And uh, so don't, don't sell yourself short and don't, don't do things that are too easy and too small. On the other hand, if, you, if you're too ambitious, you'll, you'll never finish. So I'd say, um, I mean, th think about that in terms of the topic. For sure it's there. I mean, for instance, one way would be to, s to explore this comparatively. What, what, are, what are people doing in other universities, or what are the variations in other university places? You know, Berkeley, Har Harvard, uh, uh, Cambridge. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then, for instance, there's some, there's some evangelical churches in some college towns where they, I mean, they're very different patterns in the sense that they may be inherently, and that's too strong a term, but let's say they may be opposed to some of the intellectualism of universities, but they still want to develop the town, and so they work together. So there, there, there are lots of interesting variations in these, in these respects. I would just like to talk to the locals and see if Talk to, to whom? To the locals, just people that The locals. No, no, well, no, but I'm, ask, I'm, del I'm deliberately asking because I mean, we're, we're, we've been doing an oral history of Chicago, I think I, I mentioned briefly, since the election of Harold Washington, for decades. And the reason we're doing an oral history is the locals, there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of ideology, there's a lot of 
The reason that this happened is, I will now tell you. That is, you have people who have very different views and interpretations of what's going on. So if you get three different people, you can get three totally different interpretations. I'm curious to see if age will play a role. Of course it does, but you, you know that now. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, that is, I'm saying this is, it's complicated and tricky and subtle. And as, as um, in, especially in, 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 in Hyde Park. But uh, I don't, so I'm not, uh, I guess what I'm saying is do it in a way that you don't just repeat what other people have done. Um, if you want, well, so one, one quick reference, I, I told you, and I'm, I'm, being, I'm being friendly to the guy who, who, who called me Chiang Kai shek. His name is uh, Nelson Polsky, but he, he, was a, he did a master's degree here in sociology.